America is now very populated. It's happened before. It will happen again. The first earthquake occurred around 2 a.m. on December 16, 1811 in northeastern Arkansas. Estimates placed the magnitude of this earthquake around 8.1, and it was followed within hours by another shock nearly as strong as the first. All through the night the region was shaken. When dawn brought light, the townspeople found the air clouded by a reddish haze and the landscape changed forever. In the following two months, the region would experience three more major earthquakes and almost 2,000 aftershocks. On January 23, 1812, another shock estimated at 7.8 occurred. As people stumbled into the night, they saw flashes of light emanating from the ground. Many found themselves navigating through fallen trees, wading through sand and water, or stumbling into crevices that had opened in the ground. The Mississippi River rocked back and forth, tossing boats onto shores which themselves were crumbling into the river. It was nothing short of a living nightmare. On February 7, 1812, the strongest shock yet rocked the town of New Madrid so violently that it finally fell away into the river, joining the fates of several other settlements. The river itself ran backwards, and in Tennessee a great forest suddenly became a vast lake. The ground was seen rolling like the swells of an ocean. When the swell peaked, great fissures opened in the ground, some of them running for hundreds of feet. 1,300 miles away in Boston, Massachusetts, church bells rang out in response to the shaking, and in Washington, D.C., James Madison, the sitting president of the United States, was awakened from his sleep while the White House shook. When we least expect it, when we're least prepared, disaster can strike. And few disasters are as unsettling as an earthquake. My guess is that earthquakes are really so scary because you don't have any warning. It's the only thing besides a nuclear war that can really, one second you're living in a big beautiful city and 10 seconds later it's flat. Every day the earth is shaken by hundreds of small earthquakes. Most go unnoticed. They usually occur along the boundaries of the thin plates that cover the earth like an eggshell. Driven by the heat deep within the Earth's core, the plates grind against each other on long lines called faults. When the plates find their motion blocked, stress builds up. Finally, the fault gives way. The released energy races through the Earth in the form of seismic waves. For much of the world, the movement of plates like these is also an indispensable creative force. If we didn't have earthquakes, if we didn't have this great flow of heat from the interior of the Earth, the Earth would be a cold, dead place. If it wasn't for this great flow of heat, there'd be no continents, no oceans, no atmospheres. The Earth would be as dead and dry and cold as the moon. It's really the earthquakes that create the topography, the valleys, the mountains. Earthquakes have been shaping landscapes for eons. It's only in the last few hundred years that civilization has gotten in the way. And when it does... Come on and join us to sing the seismic wave. Feel a rumble, then a grumble, what is happening you say? Underground there's a feeling of earthquake Building swaying, terror making Falling bricks block your way And with each fateful tremor you think Seismic waves, seismic waves There why the building is swaying Aftershocks, 
vaulted rocks. We'll just rebuild it next year. P and S waves and the L waves from the focus they race. Distance. P are faster, L are laster, in liquid S leaves no trace, and among all the rubble you fear. Seismic waves, seismic waves, they're why the driveway is cracking. Richter scale. Start to wail. We'll just repave it next year. We'll just repave it next year. The vibrations produced by earthquakes are detected, recorded, and measured by instruments called seismographs. A zigzag line made by a seismograph, called a seismogram, reflects the changing intensity of the vibrations by responding to the motion of the ground surface beneath the instrument. From the data expressed in seismograms, scientists can determine the time, the epicenter, the focal depth, and the type of faulting of an earthquake, and can estimate how much energy was released. The severity of an earthquake can be expressed in several ways. The magnitude of an earthquake, usually expressed by the Richter scale, is a measure of the amplitude of the seismic waves. The moment magnitude of an earthquake is a measure of the amount of energy released, an amount that can be estimated from seismograph readings. The intensity, as expressed by the modified Mercalli scale, is a subjective measure that describes how strong a shock was felt at a particular location. The Richter scale, named after Dr. Charles F. Richter of the California Institute of Technology, is the best known scale for measuring the magnitude of earthquakes. The scale is logarithmic so that a recording of a 7, for example, indicates a disturbance with ground motion ten times as large as a recording of six. A quake of magnitude two is the smallest quake normally felt by people. Earthquakes with a Richter value of six or more are commonly considered major. Great earthquakes have magnitude of eight or more on the Richter scale. Volcanism Volcanism is one of the primary forces that continuously change the Earth's surface. It comes with all kinds of volcanic activities and processes that give rise to magma cause its movement in the Earth. It also covers expulsion of gases, lava, and solid materials from the opening in the crust. Volcanic eruptions undergo two processes before the eruption. First is the melting of rock masses tens of kilometers below the Earth's surface to produce magma. The second step is the movement of this magma toward the Earth's surface. The first step determines the initial temperature and composition of the magma. The second step controls the nature and timing of eruption. Deep within the Earth, Previously solid rock melts at high temperature to become magma. Magma is a pocket of molten rock that contains variable mixture of minerals and gases. Some of the gases can be smelled around volcanic vents and hot springs. Hydrogen sulfide smells like rotten eggs or sewer gas. Sulfur smells like a wooden watch that has just been struck. As magma melts, it becomes lighter than the surrounding works. Magma works its way upward, melting other rocks in its path. As pressures from above decrease, gases are released. Near the surface, the magma is then a very hot fluid mixture. 
When magma comes out on the surface of the Earth, it is called lava. Lava reaches the surface through volcanoes or through cracks in the ground. These cracks are called fissures. Extrusive rocks are hard and lava on the Earth's surface. A volcano is a hill or mountain formed by the extrusion of lava or rock fragments from the magma below. Volcanoes act up in every possible way. Like a moody person, they can erupt in violence or steam silently, lazily creep along or self-destruct. A volcano's origin determines its temperament. Many volcanoes erupt along subduction zones. Here, the great tectonic plates of our planet's surface push against one another. Along this margin, where one plate is rolled beneath another, we find the most violent volcanoes. Explosive eruptions fit our image of a volcano. They create large cone-shaped mountains. These erupt when magma below forces its escape. Fueled by expanding gases and boiling groundwater, the excess heat blasts through. Volcanoes like this often have alternating layers of different volcanic materials, ash, cinders and lava. These layered cones are called composite volcanoes. Hawaii isn't near the joining of two plates, but it's a hot spot of volcanic activity. What fuels it? The Hawaiian Islands are hotspot islands, created when a pool of magma breaks through a thin spot in the crust. As it burns through, the plate moves along at 10 centimeters a year. One island is carried away to cool, while the next one is created in assembly line fashion. On the big island of Hawaii, Kilauea has been erupting since 1983 and shows no signs of letting up. It's an example of a second kind of volcano, the shield volcano. The central crater is called a caldera. It still steams, but probably won't erupt violently. Farther out, lava oozes and flows, creating new land as it cools. The wide flow is what creates a shield volcano rather than a cone one. This new unstable bench is pure basalt. Sometimes the flows are only inches from the surface. The thick honey-like lava typical of Hawaii cools into a harsh barren environment that can take years to support life. Cinder cones are a third kind of volcano. Mexico's Paracutin is a dramatic example. Like composite volcanoes, they can be explosively violent visitors to the surface of our planet. They burst forth with enormous quantities of ash, cinders and lava fragments. They rapidly build volcanic mountains, but never as wide as shield volcanoes or as high as composites. Cinder cone shape is determined by the size of the ejected material.